Hello, my fellow travelers. I am Anna Pomazanova, Ross Moore Excursion Desk Coordinator. Welcome to Around the World Travel Presentation. I am very happy to see you all. Today, we will go to South America and visit Buenos Aires, the capital of Argentina. Give me just a minute. There you go. Buenos Aires is located at the northeastern edge of the flat plain known as the Pampas, at the point where the Parana River Delta widens to become the Rio de la Plata estuary. The city of Buenos Aires was founded twice. It was first founded in 1536 by an expedition led by Spanish explorer Pedro Mendoza, who named it Nuestra Señora Santa Maria del Buen Air, Our Lady St. Mary of the Good Air. A monument in order of Pedro de Mendoza was erected in 1937 in Lezama Park, where supposedly Pedro de Mendoza first founded Buenos Aires. The settlement soon fell victim to local Indians and the survivors had to retreat up the river to the fortified settlement of Asuncion. Nearly 50 years later, Juan de Garay, Spanish conquistador, led a more substantial expedition back to the site and there, at the mouth of the Rio de la Plata, he established the city in 1580. Bronze statue of Juan de Garay decorates a small square in Montserrat district of Buenos Aires. Soon, Buenos Aires became the main city in the Parana Basin and its most important port. Buenos Aires locals are referred to as Portenos, people of the port, because so many of them historically arrived by boat from Europe. During the first half of the 17th century, Buenos Aires grew at a modest pace, with its port conducting an increasing amount of trade. But soon, the newly born Spanish Empire granted trade rights to few selected ports in South America, and unfortunately Buenos Aires was not one of them. As a result, trade suffered. For that reason, smuggling became a part of living. In the last quarter of the 17th century, the Partenos spread to the northwest bank of the Rio Parana to a fertile area well irrigated by many streams and small rivers. These were excellent conditions for cattle ranching. By the beginning of the 18th century, Argentina was exporting thousands of tons of dried beef, tens of thousands of cattle hides, destined for the plantations of northern Brazil and the Caribbean islands. By the mid of the 18th century, Buenos Aires was a thriving, and in 1776, Buenos Aires was named the capital of the new Viceroyalty at the Rio de la Plata that included parts of present-day Bolivia, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Chile. Trade out of Buenos Aires became legal, although the Spanish crown still attempted to control it. Silver discovered in Upper Peru, today's Bolivia, became the most valuable export. The city flourished over the last quarter of the 18th century and in the early 19th century. The independent spirit of the city was given a tremendous boost in 1806 and 1807, when local forces defeated British invasion. In 1808, when Napoleon invaded Spain and placed his brother, Joseph Bonaparte, on the throne in Madrid, many Partenos reconsidered their ties with the crown. In May 1810, the town council pronounced independence from Spain. Few other provinces followed the lead of Buenos Aires in 1816, at the Congress at Tucumán, they declared their independence. A provisional government was created, and Buenos Aires 
was named capital of the United Provinces of Rio de la Plata. Most provinces had local government and it wasn't until a decade later, under the leadership of Bortolome Mitre, that a strong government centered in Buenos Aires was established. Dramatic changes in the European market as a result of industrialization together with significant advances in technology made exploitation of the fertile plains of Argentina economically viable. By the beginning of World War I, Argentina had become one of the world's principal exporter of agricultural products. Massive amounts of wealth came into the hands of individuals who built great mansions around Plaza San Martin or close to Avenida Santa Fe. These mansions today house government ministries or foreign embassies. The owners of the mansions, members of the ruling elite, decided that they would transform Buenos Aires into the Paris of South America. As part of the preparation for the May 1910 celebration of the Declaration of Independence, the city council decided to build a subway system and a network of broad avenues radiating out from the city center. The plan also called for the construction of the broadest avenue in the world, named Avenida Nueva de Julio, after July 9th, official National Day of Independence, that block-wide swath was cut through the city in the 1930s and opened officially in October 1937. One of the most prominent events in Buenos Aires history was the election of President Juan Perón in 1946. Perón set Argentina on a course of industrialization and state intervention in the economy, calculated to provide greater economic and social benefits for the working class. He nationalized the railroads and other utilities and financed public works on a large scale. His wife, Eva Perón, or Evita, used her position as first lady to speak on behalf of labor rights, supporting higher wages and greater social welfare benefits. Evita also advocated for women's suffrage in Argentina that was enacted in 1947. Eva Perón died of cancer on July 26, 1952. Shortly before her death, she was given the title of Spiritual Leader of the Nation by the Argentina Congress. Her story was the subject of many articles, books, stage plays, and television shows, and eventually a Broadway musical and a Hollywood film, Evita. After the death of Juan Perón in 1974, terrorist activity and political violence in Argentina increased. On March 24, 1976, the armed forces took power, establishing a brutal military dictatorship that lasted until 1983. According to human rights organization, about 30,000 people disappeared in Argentina during this period. After defeat in Franklin's War, Argentina returned to democratic government. In early 200s, Buenos Aires was greatly affected by Argentina's faltering economy. In 2001, the country suffered a massive economic collapse after defaulting on its foreign debt payment. Inflation increased by 50%, and the unemployment rate in Buenos Aires reached an all-time high. Violent protests occurred in the city, as Portenos and others demonstrated their dissatisfaction with the government's handling of the economy. 
Despite these numerous obstacles, at the beginning of the 21st century, Buenos Aires exhibited signs of social and economic improvements, especially in response to development in technology. Moreover, Buenos Aires has remained the cultural heart of Argentina, shaping much of the country's identity through education, art, publishing, and radio and television shows. Today, about one-fourth of the Argentina's population of 42 million lives in Buenos Aires. Beloved capital of Argentina, Buenos Aires combines European architecture and Latin passion for soccer, delicious meat, and, of course, tango. Plaza de Mayo is the most iconic square in Buenos Aires. It is the oldest public square and has been the scene of many of the most important events in the city's history, from the second founding of the city in 1580, through the revolution of independence, to more recent political demonstrations. The square is named after the Argentine Revolution, which began on May 25th, 1810. The square was also the location for Argentina's first political rally in 1890. It has remained the focal point for public gatherings, either in support of or to protest against successive governments ever since. A tradition that reached its apex with the crowds that came to hear Evita speaking from the balcony of the Casa Rosada in the late 1940s. The Madres de la Plaza de Mayo Mothers of the Plaza de Mayo began meeting in the square in 1977 to demand information about their missing children and husbands during Argentina's last military dictatorship. They continued to meet in the square and march around the May Pyramid every Thursday at 3.30 p.m. Around the square there are several important buildings. Facing the Plaza de Mayo, the Metropolitan Cathedral is the Catholic Church's main site in Argentina. The cathedral's history is a long and turbulent one. Since the first chapel of the same site was constructed in 1593 under the order of the city's founder, Juan de Garay, the building has been resigned and rebuilt seven times. The last construction, the one that we see today, was started in 1752, but not completed until the mid-19th century. You may be struck by the building's facade, more reminiscent of a Greek temple than a Catholic church. The twelve neoclassical columns at the front represent the twelve apostles of the Christ, supporting a triangular front piece. The relief on the front piece depicts the encounter between Jacob and his son, Joseph, in Egypt, and was intended as an allegory of the unity of Argentine nation after the civil unrest. The cathedral's impressive interior is in neo-Romanesque and neo-Baroque style. Its floors are covered by Venetian mosaic and depict various religious symbols, like the Passion Flower, which symbolizes the Passion of Christ. In one of the chapels, is the mausoleum of San Martin and the unknown soldier. This marble pantheon is the work of French sculptor Louis Robert Carie Belize. Around the sarcophagus, three female figures representing Argentina, Chile, and Peru recall the countries liberated by General San Martin. The grenadiers at the entrance to the tomb stand guard and pay homage to the founder of their institution. In the center of the altar is the statue of Virgin of Buen Air, 
after whom first the port and then the city were named. At the top are images of Saint Martin, the patron saint of the city of Buenos Aires, and the pa patron saint of sailors. They hold a caravel, a light that sailing ships commonly used in the 15th of a century to navigate. The main gilded wood altarpiece depicts the Holy Trinity. It is one of the few remaining elements from colonial times, dating from 1785, and is in Rococo style. Another notable colonial sculpture is the Christ of Buenos Aires, the oldest sculpture in the cathedral, carved by Portuguese sculptor Manuel de Coyoto in 1671. Before leaving the cathedral, turn back and look up to see the main organ, an 1871 Walker organ built in Germany with more than 3,500 pipes. Pope Francis conducted Mass at the Metropolitan Cathedral for 20 years before assuming office in Vatican in 2013. The cathedral now houses the Pope Francis Museum, which exhibits some of his personal and liturgical objects. Another historic building on the Plaza de Macho, El Cab Cabildo de Buenos Aires, was the site of Spain's colonial administration in the city. Originally constructed in 1580, the current building was constructed over the second half of the 18th century. It witnessed the revolution of 1810 and served at the city hall after Argentina proclaimed its independence from Spain. The building now houses the National Museum of the Cabilda and the May Revolution and displays original artifacts and documents, as well as interactive exhibits on the Spanish colonial era and British invasion of 1806 and 1807 and the early days of independence. The museum was renovated in 2016 and now includes access to the former jail and more historic documents. Close to El Cabildo, Café Tortoni has been a local icon for more than 150 years. Lined with fancy art and chic decor, Café Tortoni has been the intellectual hub for Argentina's elite since 1850. Today, it is the ultimate point of pilgrimage for a café and fix in Buenos Aires. Dominating the Plaza de Macho, the Casa Rosada, or Pink House, is the seat of the Argentine national government and houses the president's office. Witness to much of the city's history, it was from the balconies of the Casa Rosada that Juan and Evita Piron addressed the masses during the late 1840s and early 1950s. The Casa Rosada was constructed on the site of the fort established by the Spanish in 1580. After independence, the fort was developed into a custom house by British architect Edward Taylor, and later, in 1862, the building was chosen by President Bartholomew Mitre to be the seat of his government. His successor, Domingo Faustina, Sarmiento later expanded the building and is believed to have ordered it to be painted pink in an attempt to diffuse political tensions by mixing the colors of the opposing political parties. The Federals used red while the Unitarians used white. So he mixed it together and it became pink. The Casa Rosada Museum includes an eclectic variety of exhibits which were owned by various Argentine leaders. Designed in 1957 to display presidential memorabilia, the collection includes remnants of the original fort that stood on the current site, 
as well as the customs house. Also on displays are books, furniture, swords, and carriages used by former presidents, in addition to flatware, dishes, and dolls. A section is set aside exclusively for Eva Peron. But if you want to learn more about the country's legendary first lady, head to the Evita Museum in Palermo, the city's largest and most beloved neighborhood. Across the 13 permanent exhibition rooms and one temporary display room, the museum reviews the history of Eva Duarte from her childhood, going through youth as an actress, and then her life as first lady next to Juan Perón. Her fight for civil rights, the social work she developed in the foundation until her resignation and death. Eva Perón died from cancer in 1952 at the age of 32. Public grief was intense and unprecedented in Argentina. There is no doubt that she was a remarkable woman who made her mark on history. Also in Palermo, not far from the Evita Museum, the Recoleta Cemetery is the final resting place of many of Argentina's wealthiest and most famous families and personas. The entrance to the cemetery is through neoclassical gates with tall Greek columns. The cemetery contains many elaborate marble mausoleums decorated with statues in a wide variety of architectural styles. The mausoleums are fairly small, and it's common for many members, generations even, of the same family occupy one mausoleum. The entire cemetery is laid out in sections like city blocks, with wide, tree-lined main walkways branching into sidewalks filled with graves. The cemetery includes graves of mo some of the most influential and important Argentinians, including several presidents, scientists, and wealthy characters. Eva Perón is perhaps the best-known person buried in this cemetery. Buenos Aires is no stranger to the arts. Located next to the Recoleta Cemetery, the Museo Nacional de Bellas Artes, or National Museum of Fine Arts, has an impressive 100-year history and contains a stunning mix of European and Argentine art. Famous names like Picasso and Van Gogh are displayed permanently, as well as Argentinian greats like Benito Quincuela Martín. This fine art museum is free to visit. The enormous metal flower blooms anew each day in a pool of water next to the National Museum of Fine Arts, revealing four long stamens inside. Designed and paid by the Argentine architect Eduardo Catalano, the Floralis Generica has been a striking city landmark since it opened in 2002. Its six 13-meter-long petals open, which takes about 20 minutes at 8 in the morning, and slowly close again at sunset, mimicking the action of the real flower. When open, this amazing man-made flower is an incredible 105 feet wide. The other city neighborhoods are very diverse. San Telmo is the best place to find souvenirs in the patio shops of rustic colonial buildings. Tucked away from the usual tourist tracks, Baracas is one of the oldest neighborhoods in Buenos Aires. In the 19th century, Baracas was the center of activity and contained many of the city's most famous stores at the time. Some of Buenos Aires' wealthiest families owned homes in the area. However, in 1871, an epidemic of yellow fever forced most of them to move north, away from the river. 
mansions were transformed into apartment buildings, modest cafes were opened, attracting people with lower financial status. In the 20th century, Italians and other immigrants populated Baracas. In 2000, one local artist, Marino Santa Maria, who was born in Baracas to an Italian immigrant family, decided to decorate his house studio on Calle Lanin with colorful tile mosaics. Inspired, he then decorated his neighbors' houses as well. Little by little, Marina Santa Maria changed the appearance of Baracas. Soon, 34 houses spanning three blocks were covered with vivid mosaics. The artist worked with his neighbors to create unique designs tailored to each individual house. Some owners even cleaned up the area around their houses to highlight the artwork. Visitors are welcome to walk around the narrow cobblestone streets of this open-air gallery in Baracas at any time. The artist, Marina Santa Maria, still lives there and even occasionally gives tours of his work. A colorful neighborhood with immigrant roots, La Boca is like an open-air gallery. Its origins date back to the arrival of the Spanish explorers in the 16th century who established the city's first port here. The area really started to grow with the wave of immigration in the 19th century. Caminito Street, Little Path in Spanish, is the neighborhood's main attraction. It is filled with colorfully painted houses typical of the immigrant dwelling that characterized this portside area towards the end of the 19th and the start of the 20th century. The Caminito followed the route of an old stream that dried up, then it was a railroad route. After the closure of the railroad, the street was largely abandoned until the 1950s, when a group of neighbors decided to regenerate the area and local artist Benito Quintuela Martin began using the buildings as canvas. Today, the Caminito has become a favorite place for visitors to the city. While in the harbor, check out the La Bombonera Stadium, where soccer legend Diego Maradona started his career. This iconic Argentine stadium in the La Boca neighborhood gets its name from the fact that it looks like a box of chocolates. The stadium can accommodate 50,000 fans, all screaming, singing, and pouring out their souls for Boca Juniors, one of the Argentina's best football or soccer teams. In La Boca, you'll find numerous street vendors, restaurants, and street tango dancers willing to give you a spin. La Boca Harbor is where this famous dance originates. The National Congress building, home to Argentina's parliament, is situated at the end of Avenida de Macho. Construction started in 1898 and was still only partially finished in 1906 when President José Figuero Alcorta inaugurated it. The dome of the palace, 80 meters high, can be seen from far away. It is covered in copper, which in contact with the air turns beautiful green color. Tourists, as well as the general public, can get a guided tour around the National Congress building every week except Thursdays. The tour shows visitors the Chamber of Deputies and the library noted for its walnut wood hand-carved panels. While a bit more off the beaten path, Palazzo Barolo, conceived by cotton magnate Luis Barolo, is among the top architectural masterpieces in Buenos Aires. Work began on the building in 1919 and was completed in 1923. The architect, 
Maria Pallanti pulled inspiration from Dante's Divine Comedy to construct a 22-story building with floors representing heaven, hell, and everything in between. Walking through Palacio Barolo is a mind-blowing experience. The lobby, a central hall, radiates out from a central dome into nine vaulted archways, which represent the nine circles of hell, as described by Dante in the Inferno. The walls are adorned with monster statues, and there are inscriptions of Latin verses on the ceiling. You can find Masonic symbols on the walls, floors, and still operating elevators. The highest levels representing heaven begin at the observation deck with the sprawling view of Buenos Aires. At the building's highest point, a hundred meters up, representing 100 cantons of the Divine Comedy, is a still-working lighthouse. To, book this, to tour this building, you have to book a tour, but it's definitely worth it. End your day with a stroll in Puerto Madero, where modern parks and contemporary architecture complement the preserved remnants of the port's glory days. A high-end refurbished port district, Puerto Madero is your go-to for treating yourself to upscale restaurants and taking in some stunning architecture. Enjoy a fine dinner served late at night and stay out until the sun comes up. Well, it is hard not to fall in love with Buenos Aires, this rhythmic capital city of Argentina, and it is definitely on my bucket list. I hope you guys enjoy this presentation on Buenos Aires. It's a beautiful city uh, with wonderful architecture and definitely worth a visit. I hope to see you next Wednesday for another Around the World Travel presentation. For now, stay safe and healthy. Goodbye.